Okay, hi everyone, my name is Leif. Uh, I know a lot of you online uh, through uh, Lemon64 and various forums I, where I post as schema. So this is my very first convex, so it's uh, great to you know, put lots of faces to names and see what's going on on the uh, almost uh, west coast. So I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the Commodore-related hobby projects that I've been involved in, and they, uh, some of you might have seen some of these at, in, at the Chicago show and so on, but here's an overview for some of you who haven't seen some of these. So my first pro uh, project is my motion sensing gl uh, gaming glove. Some of you have seen this running over here and got a chance to try it out, so here's a bit of background. So I have a friend who works, uh, who formed a company called Sonicware up in Toronto. This is an offshoot from the Ontario College of Art and Design. And it's a university with a lot of cool interactive art uh, programs, including wearable technology. So they developed this device called the SOMO that generates music and MIDI data through motion. And the SOMO device itself is just a tiny little board with an Arduino compatible microcontroller on it, accelerometer, magnetometer, uh, gyroscope, and a wireless radio. So the original intent was that a dancer would wear this and as he or she dances, that motion gets turned into music. But since the SOMO is Arduino compatible, it was uh, pretty easy for me to uh, you know, buy one of the boards and reprogram it and repurpose it for something Commodore related because that's what we do here. <laughs> so uh, next slide please. So I adapted it to uh, read the accelerometer uh, so that you get the gravity vector, and by rotating your hand, uh, I can detect that angle, the little bit of a dead band, and by, if you exceed a certain threshold, that gives you your directions up, down, left, right. And then I use some conductive fabric on the glove for a fire button. You just uh, pinch your fingers, that closes the circuit, and you get your fire button. So uh, I'm using a radio called the XB, which works as uh, wireless RS-232, but you can also use it in something called IO reflection mode, which is Super cool and simple. Just a zero or one on the XB over here it gets reflected as a zero or one on the XB over there. So all, all uh, part of what's called the Zigbee standard. And uh, so I just reprogrammed the radios to, to do that. And uh, I've, a lot of people have been saying this is really cool. I would like to play with this. Where do I get one? And so I'm now that we have Kickstarter in Canada, <laughs> I'm, uh, which we didn't for the longest time. You had to have a US bank account, so it was just terrible. But we do have Kickstarter in Canada now, so I'm putting some serious uh, thought and effort into doing a Kickstarter campaign to make a couple of dozen of these. You know, oh. We shall see what the demand is. Watch me get 10,000. <laughs> this becomes my new full-time job. I'll buy one. Okay, uh, next slide. So you can't read any of this, but this is just a block diagram of how the uh, signals are passed through right from the uh, accelerometer over SPI to the Arduino, over digital I.O. to the XB, over the wireless, into a buffer chip, and then out to the joystick port. And it's powered right off the 64's uh, joystick port, so that's pretty cool. It's a little live demo. So here's the glove that I got at uh, <laughs> Toronto's Chinatown for $3. All right. And uh, so you can, I'm playing my favorite game, Zone Ranger, here, and flying around and doing stuff. So up, down, left, right, and the fire button. But the range... This is where I drive the cameraman crazy. The range is pretty amazing on this. Like, I, outdoors, you can, uh, some models of XP, you can get, you know, a couple miles. So, yeah, I'm out in the hallway, it's still going. <laughs> yep. Which is not actually useful, right? <laughs> so if this was up on the big screen, though, this would be a totally different experience. But there you are. So I'll have this set up at, at my table for the whole day and then come and give it a try. Yeah. Oop. Okay, as if I didn't have enough to do. I'm also uh, dabbling on a multiplayer network game for the Commodore 64. So a bit of history. Uh, everyone in the room probably knows there's been a ton of different uh, Ethernet and TCP IP solutions for the 64, so, you know, for 10 years now, the final Ethernet, RRNet, FBNet, 64 NIC, and there's the Comet, the Flyer, the Wiz 5100, E64, and so forth. There's a lot of tools. So we have disk imaging, and we have file transfer, and telnet clients, and cross-development tools, chat programs, even operating systems like Kentucky. So a couple of years ago I thought, but what about games? Like com games were always the Commodore 64's uh, strength and draw, so let's make some games. 
Next slide, please. So a couple of early uh, attempts. So back in 2006 now, which uh, I put together a very simple little two-player game uh, based on artillery duel. So it's just turn-based. You just shoot at each other over a mountain, but it's pretty fun. Also has a chat capability, but it's, you see it's very simple, one-on-one, -on -one, minimal game world. Then in 2008, did something a little more ambitious. So it's real time, it's not turn-based. It's multiplayer, uh, has a limit of eight players. That, that limit is actually imposed by the number of sprites on the C64. <laughs> wow. in, in theory, you could have more, but it just the sprite multiplexing became insane. Introduced a server, so there was a Java-based server that coordinated everything. And it was a much larger game world, but the game world is still static. Next slide, please. All right, so 2013, I thought, I'm gonna try something a little more ambitious. I want it to be real time again, massively multiplayer, you know, massively. You know, massively. For, you know, <laughs> uh, so unlimited number of players, server controlled entities, so you can have, there's you know, a little uh, bit of AI on the server for uh, enemies to uh, go at. More complex, uh, complex gameplay, so I wanted to have multiple goals. So encouraging teamwork, like no one player can beat the game on their own. They need to coordinate with other people. And again, here's this word again, massive and a dynamic game world, so one that changes. So how massive? I'm targeting 10,000 C64 screens. <laughs> so if you ever wondered what 10,000 Commodore 64 screens look like, it's something like that. So every screen, as you know, 40 by 25 character cells. So that's uh, 10 million character cells or 640 million pixels. So some inspiration for this, I call it Vortex 2 because I'm uh, making it as a sequel to the original Vortex, which was published in Ahoy magazine back in the day. It was a fun little space shoot up aliens thing. And anyway, Zone Ranger, my favorite game that I'm playing again with the glove. Fort Apocalypse. What a, uh, the element that I took from Fort Apocalypse is the dynamic world. You can shoot, at, you know, shoot your way through the caves and so on. I thought that was pretty cool. I want to do that in a multiplayer fashion. Uh, subspace on the PC, again, you know, multiplayer flying through space. And because I have kids, Minecraft, <laughs> that the, the epitome of the dynamic game world with multiple players going in and uh, mucking with the game world. So there's the game, Vortex 2. I want it to be a fast paced overhead 2D space shoot 'em up, dogfight with alien ships, seek power ups, and save the universe. Mm. Teamwork encouraged again, but there's a lot of gameplay details to be worked out. Like I just have this vision of flying through space and getting power ups and shooting at things but very specific gameplay details, that's still in progress. Next. So a few technical decisions. The server does a lot of the logic. So the 64 actually becomes more of a display and input client, but that's, you know, that's how, how it works. Uh, the server's written in Java 7, and so I'm streaming the, uh, the, uh, the screen that you would be able to see from the server in real time to the 64, and then streaming the player's actions back to the server. I'm writing it in CA65, and this uses the IP65 network library. So a few technical challenges. How to find enough raster time, because the network routines take up a big chunk of your raster time, so you only have this much left for game logic, and that makes sprite multiplexing impossible. Got to sort some of that out. Yeah, again, can't, uh, how to handle the eight sprite limit. And I want to get into algorithmic generation of the game universe, so you'll see that it's very simple at the moment. But I want to do something much more complex. You just hit go and the game universe is generated for you. And I want to do multiple clients. Like suppose, well, like why not have an Android and iOS client? So you can have someone on a 64 playing head to head with somebody on their uh, iPhone. I showed this at uh, the Vintage Computer Festival uh, Midwest, and the Apple II folks are saying, well, we want a client too. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here's where I am with the game. So uh, <laughs> I do software engineering at my day job, and it kind of seeps into my hobbies once in a while. So I've written a uh, series of uh, design documents. <laughs> Those already is the first draft. I have a VPS running a bunch of server uh, in Montreal to you know, run the, the game server. I've got some uh, first iteration of the graphics and so forth ready. Uh, we have all the codes up on GitHub if anyone wants to have a look, and we have a Google group. So the game is playable. I don't have a live demo here, but I've got a bunch of screenshots. And uh, 
one thing that I'm particularly proud of is the game runs off the server. You just have a tiny little, you know, 7K, a little 7,000 byte stub that you run in your 64, and it downloads and runs the game for you. So the game is auto-updating, and you always get the latest version. So I think that's the first auto-updating game for the 64. <laughs> So first screenshot, there's the boot screen, just getting an IP address over DHCP and uh, reaching out to the server. Mm. There's some of the graphics from uh, Saul Cross. So this is a live screenshot. I'm just realizing how hard it is to actually take a photo of your 64 monitor <laughs> with, your, uh, with your phone. And so you saw some of the sprites. This is a map screen generated by the server. So you can go on your browser and go to uh, the, uh, the server address and it'll generate for you a real-time snapshot map of all the entities in the game. So there you can see there's, you know, there's about 10,000 asteroids and of all the green and red are all the enemy ships on different, different uh, races. The, uh, the circle is just a test of an asteroid field. I want to make that a little more involved, make the maze you have to go through. And you can see that white blob or a bunch of torpedoes, so there's a battle in, uh, in, in, in progress. I just took this screenshot about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so this is running live on the server <laughs> right now. <laughs> so even when no one's connected, the, uh, the alien ships sit there and shoot at each other. Wow. It's, uh, it's kind of, some people have fish tanks. This is what I have. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, the group. So I'm putting together the concept, the networking code, and the server code, again, in Java. Uh, Saul Cross, who some of you know, is doing the uh, graphics. Uh, Bryce Wilson is helping me with the client code. Robin Harbrin, uh, Macbeth at PSW, is involved in everything, and he uh, is giving me tons of advice. John O'Donnes uh, took over the IP65 code from uh, Pierre Olofsson, so uh, he's been giving me some network uh, help. And then a handful of uh, playtesters, Dan and Rob. And you. So this is turning into a pretty massive effort. I'd love some assistance on the 64 coding. You know, there's no sound in the game yet. Uh, that's not a strength, so I need to, someone to uh, take that on and so forth. So if you want to get involved in this, come and talk to me and we'll figure out where to, where to add you. Yes, hey, Rob. Uh, question. Um, at the Vintage Computer Festival East, Dan Ruganti and uh, I forget who else, they were trying to get a multiplayer game going yeah, on. Yeah, Space Command. Eight computers or something like that, eight C64s there. And by the end of the weekend, they they couldn't get it going. Did they ever get it going? Because I think they were stuck on, you know, every time they press fire, the system would just lock up on them. Every time they pressed the, the not the fire button, the, but the, you know, the, the button on the joystick, it would just lock up. So yeah, they would, fix that? Uh, they haven't got it working yet, but oh. they're close. Yeah, okay. I've been talking to them and giving them some hints here and there. Okay. The trouble is when you have, cause they, when you have, like one of their 64s is the server, yeah. but they're also using UDP, which is the user datagram protocol. Mm -hmm. which means that your code has to do all the acknowledgements and back and forth and synchronization of the game state. And uh, that's a very challenging thing even on a you know, modern PC game. So they're you know, working through that in, in their assembler code. But they're close. Oh, OK. Yeah, you got to see some screenshots from the mm -hmm. UCF. It looks amazing. OK, last thing I'll talk about. This is a, totally a sales pitch. This is the uh, public domain library CD from TPUG. So this was four years in the making. It's 10,000 public domain programs for your Commodore. And not just the C64, it's Amiga, 64, Vic, Comal, Pet, Super Pet, Geos, C128. Someone asked about B128. Yep, we've got it. And even CPM. Plus some other value on the CD. There's a bunch of historical photos. Uh, the catalog, so scans of all the original PDF, or PDF scans of all the original newsletters from back in the day where that TPUG would give to members saying, here's what's on this month's disk. This is what's on, what's on this uh, disk. I've got all that. And emulators, so you can be up and running right away. And, and a bunch of tools that uh, go along with that. 20 bucks. So I've got a stack of them here if you want one. Next slide. And just here's some of the uh, example of some of the historical photos that we have available. So we've got a whole bunch of Jim Butterfield back in the day. Got permission from his uh, family to include a bunch of him from back in the 80s. Shots from the world of Commodore, you know, back in late 87. You know, conventions where you'd have you know, 3,000 people come and show up, and uh, little VIC-20 powered robots. And, oh, uh, VIC-20 powered robots. Yeah, there's a VIC uh, motherboard inside that Ooh, robot. I don't know where the... Rarity. 
Yeah, the real rarity is the robot. I don't know where the robot is. So it's no, it's Find fun to robot. track it down. So yeah, I've got a whole bunch of those here. They're you know professionally produced shrink wrap CDs, uh, twenty bucks. So I just threw a ton of information at everybody. Any questions? Uh, if people wanted to get in contact with you, how do they do it? Uh, well, come and talk to me. You can find me on all the various uh, Commodore or most of the Commodore forums as Schema, and uh, email me. Uh, come and uh, get tell us my about, email address. Tell us about TPUG. How many members do you have in TPUG? TPUG currently has about 75 members. Yeah, we meet monthly. About 20 people show up at the monthly meetings, and each meeting has a different theme. You meet every month except in the summertime? Except, yeah, we do not meet in the summer. Ah. We usually get together at someone's house for a barbecue okay. or something. But. Because, you know, I'd like to visit in the summertime, but you guys are not meeting, so. Yeah, it is it is a running joke that, like, we have the, you know, they have the, we have the Vegas Expo <laughs> in the height of summer, and then we have the Canadian Expo, which is the world of Commodore, in December. Yes. So, <laughs> well, we're, that was what Commodore all, all originally did with their world of Commodore. They had it the first weekend of December in order to catch the Christmas market. So we we're following that tradition. Uh, tell us about uh, the world of Commodore. How big of a show is it? What size room? How many people attend? You know. Oh, uh, so the world of Commodore is uh, held every, the first weekend of December every year. Uh, it's in a convention center in Mississauga, Ontario, just outside of Toronto. It's in a room about twice the size. We have a vendor room and a presentation room. And uh, on a good year, we get 100 people out. Question at the back. Yes. Uh, the club, I'm assuming it works on any, anything with the 910 joystick port? Yes. It's like Atari 2600? Yeah, Atari 2600. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to try it on an Atari, actually, just to say for sure that it works. You haven't actually play tested it, though, on, on an Atari? On Atari. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's a good Other questions for Lee? Anyone? Okay, thank you, Lee. Okay, thank you all.